I said that the gospel was going to be a bit challenging in the way it presents our Lord today. And uh, I hope you paid close enough attention to the sequence of events there that, you know, you're like, okay, what's going on with, with Jesus and this, and this woman? And, and if I could sum up the gospel in one word, it would be persistence, persistence, persistence. Persistence, persistence, persistence. And we have a contrast, and I'm going to have to ask you to try to remember seven days ago, the gospel from last Sunday. Last Sunday, we had Peter. Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water. Remember that? He got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and he started to sink. And he said, Lord, help me. And Jesus grabbed him and jerked him out of the water, right? Y'all remember that? And there's a contrast between this story and that. We have last week, Peter, a Jew, a man in Jesus's inner group. He says, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches and grabs him. This week, we have an unnamed Gentile woman outsider with a daughter that has a demon. And we see the contrast between these two. And there is a mystery that we, we, including me, we have to wrestle with. And this mystery is front and center in the gospel today. And the mystery is how God has chosen to reveal himself to humanity. You know, and, and this is a puzzle that we need to bring to our prayer life, that we need to wrestle with and ask questions about. And, and, and you know, when we don't understand, tell God we don't understand. I'm going to take us to the book of Revelation for just a moment. And in the book of Revelation, there's a scene. And the scene is painted for us in heaven. And in heaven, there's, there's weeping. There's weeping because there's this scroll. And this scroll has writing on the front and the back. And nobody can open it. Nobody can read it. Nobody can understand the scroll. And then somebody says, don't weep, look. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the person there looked and he sees not a lion, but he sees a lamb that appears to have been slain. When you and I hear a lamb that appears to have been slain, we need to think of the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and the cross on which he appears to have been slain. So who can open the scroll? Who can understand these things? the lamb who appears to have been slain. So the lamb goes over, takes the scroll, and he can open the scroll. So Jesus and the cross, and the cross is the lens through which we read, particularly the things in the gospel that we struggle to understand. So I just want to say that. Well, God in his infinite wisdom chose to ch call Abraham, and Abraham Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And Israel was raised up by God as a vessel of mercy for the world. That's what Israel's job was, to bring God's presence to the world. Unfortunately, the nation of Israel, infected with the disease of sin, could not and did not do that mission effectively. So guess who replaces the nation of Israel in himself? Guess who is, if you will, God's firstborn son? Jesus. And so Jesus comes to take over for the failed mission of Israel. Y'all following me? So we have the world that's divided into two groups. We have the world that's divided into two groups. It's the nation of Israel that was supposed to be God's presence into the world. And the Gentiles, who are the people that God's people, that the Jews were supposed to bring God to. So the Gentiles are variously called. They're called the Gentiles. They're called the nations. They're called the pagans. They're called the foreigners. They're called the dogs. All of these different names would be applied in the Jewish mind to the Gentile people. 
Now remember how God has chosen to come to us through the nation of Israel. Israel stumbled in their job. Jesus comes essentially to say, you know, I have to have mercy on the whole world. We have this scroll that's hard to understand. How do we understand it? Through the lens of the cross. Through the lens of the cross. So with that said, let's get into the gospel a little bit. The different sects of, of Jews had a different relationship with different groups of Gentiles. One group of the Gentiles was the Canaanites. Jesus has left Jewish territory. He's gone to the region of Tyre and Sidon where Canaanites live. And lo and behold, who does he run into? A Canaanite woman. Imagine that. Now this Canaanite woman has some kind of attractive attraction to the Jewish religion. She knows something about the Jewish religion. Now let's remember something else. I, I, Again, I'm given a lot of information, but hopefully all of you or most of you know these things. There was a temple built in Jerusalem, and in that temple, there was the inner court, if you will, that was for the Jewish people, and there was an outer court for the Gentile people. God's house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all people. Now, so this Canaanite woman could have gone to the temple. She could have been one who went to the outer court and prayed. We don't know. But we, what we do know, if you can remember this, is that Jesus went to the temple one day and he was very upset with what was happening in the Gentile quarter because they turned it into Walmart, right? They were buying and selling and, and all of that. And so Jesus got there and said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for all people and you're ruining it. So Jesus flips over the tables and drives them out and says, we need to give the Gentiles a place to pray, to come. But this Canaanite woman, this Gentile woman, this foreigner, she approaches Jesus. She's praying not even for herself. Although I guess when a mother play, prays for her children, she is kind of praying for herself. She's praying for her daughter. She's seeking the God of the Jews. Her daughter's life and health of mind and body and spirit were important to her. They mattered to her. So she comes to Jesus and she says, have pity on me. Lord, son of David. She calls him Lord. She calls him son of David. Who is David? David is the king, the first, well, the, the second king of Israel, but the first real chosen by God, king of Israel. King David, Jesus is the son of David. Ha Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. Some of you might be following along in the gospel now, but if you didn't follow along in the gospel, try to remember what was Jesus's response to her? Remember what it was? Utter silence. He doesn't say a word to her. Utter silence. What is her response to that silence? Have pity on me. My daughter is tormented by a demon. The gospel says Jesus did not say a word in answer to her. Now, I don't know who this woman is. I don't know her backstory. I only know what's given to us in the gospel, but I also know that God tailors his response to our prayers to us individually. God knows us individually, God knows us personally, God knows us intimately. And so Jesus hears her prayer and he doesn't say anything to her. Now, maybe she spends time at the, at the, at the pagan temples too. Maybe she says, hey, here comes Jesus, I'll give him a try, you know, who knows? But Jesus doesn't say a word and then the next thing that happens is the disciples do what they so often do 
And it's funny that I mentioned this on Saturday morning. There was another gospel that had this kind of thing in it where here's this woman calling after Jesus. Jesus doesn't say anything to her. And then the disciples come immediately and tell Jesus, send her away. Send her away. Send her away. And I can think about somebody who is praying and it doesn't feel like God does them any good. And then they go talk to the priest. The priest doesn't do them any good either, you know? Send her away. See, this woman's story isn't just her story, it's our story. Sometimes we feel like maybe God doesn't hear us, don't we? Maybe he's even ignoring us. Maybe the priests aren't any help at all. Maybe the ministers aren't not only doing us any good, they're getting in the way. And so what is this woman's response? Send her away. She keeps calling out. And then Jesus says something again that kind of throws us off. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's why I started the homily this morning with this backstory about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jesus or God establishing his nation. So Jesus comes and there is an order of revelation. And so Jesus is coming to regather Israel, reconstitute Israel. That's why he's got his 12 apostles. He's remaking the nation of Israel. So he says to her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the disciples are getting in the way. You know what I was expecting her to say, him to say was, there's another story similar to this one about a blind man in Jericho. It'd be nice if y'all were familiar enough with the gospel. He's like, oh yeah, I know that story. About the blind man in Jericho. Jesus is coming out of Jericho and a blind man says, son of David, have pity on me. The disciples say, tell him to be quiet. Jesus says, bring him to me. But that's not what he says in this case. He says, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This Canaanite woman starting to give us this example of focused, persistent, humble prayer. The woman represents all seekers, all the people of all the nations, everybody that's ever lived that didn't have easy access to God. She says three simple words, Lord, help me. Certainly Jesus is going to break down now, right? Lord, help me, she says. And he says, it is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? How does she feel? What's going on? You almost feel sorry for her at this point, don't you? It's not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. What did I say we called the, that you had the Jews and you had the Gentiles? They were the Gentiles, they were the foreigners, they were the nations, they were the pagans, they were the dogs. And Jesus is aware of all of this. It's not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. And she said, please, Lord, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. This woman, I think, you know, a scripture scholar helped me understand this. She understood she wasn't part of the covenant people. She understood that she was not one of the chosen people, so to speak. She understood her relationship was not the same as the nation of Israel. And what was her response? Just give me the leftovers. This humble, persistent prayer that, what, how I said I'd sum up this gospel in one word, and I said persistence, persistence, persistence. I have to add maybe a second word, humility. Please, Lord. Even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their master. Then Jesus said to her in reply, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. 
Sometimes Jesus responds to us. Sometimes we feel like he's far away and he's ignoring us altogether. Sometimes the ministers and the priests of the church help us on our journey to Jesus. Sometimes they get in the way. Sometimes Jesus is firm. Sometimes Jesus is gentle. Sometimes he's willing. He's willing to make us be patient. See, God knows when a person is ready to receive a particular grace. God is not afraid to test our faith. God is not afraid to humble us. God is not afraid to purify our heart. He is not afraid to give us an opportunity to grow in humility or some specific way. I know people that have struggled with the same problems and challenges for years and decades and multiple decades. And I sometimes wonder why can't they get over their problems? And I think maybe God is just humbling them. I don't know, but I know God has a plan. And sometimes that plan is to make us wait. And sometimes that plan is to humble us. And sometimes that plan is all we can do is look at the cross and say, God, I don't understand. Maybe that's where you are in reading this gospel today. I don't understand why you would say those things. I don't understand why you would treat that woman that way. I don't know. I can't help. I'm going to close my homily by talking about uh, St. Augustine and St. Martha. You know, some of you know the story. Because remember, who was this woman praying for? Her child. Not even praying for herself. And so St. Augustine was a man who was raised by a Christian mother and a pagan father. And St. Augustine left any idea of Christianity far behind him. And his mother was very concerned about his spiritual and emotional well-being. And she prayed for him for year after year after year after decade. And she went and saw a priest and the bishop said, I, I can't do anything for you, but your tears are going to be heard by God. And ultimately, St. Augustine, as we, I call him St. Augustine, was converted. And uh, not only, then St. Martha said, God answered my prayers in ways I could not have even imagined. Which goes, brings us back to the cross. Because the cross is a symbol of God taking the sins of all of the world, the Jews and the Gentiles, upon himself. And showering us with his mercy. So, can a mother forget her infant? Be without tenderness for the child of her womb? Even if she should forget, I will never forget you. See, I have written your names on the palms of my hands.